um, hi, so could you please state your name and position in relevance to forestry? Okay, so uh, my name is Will Martin and I'm the Executive Director of the Windhorse Education Foundation and I'm also a forestry consultant and uh, forestry entrepreneur. Um, could you tell us a little about your sustainable practice here at Wind, Wind Horse? Uh, well, Windhorse Farm is actually, we like to say it's the longest standing example of sustainable forestry in Canada. The forest here has been a, a managed working forest for over 170 years. And when you walk through our lands, uh, it still looks like a fully healthy, vibrant, old growth Acadian forest. Uh, we've generated a lot of timber off these lands, and, um, and yet we're also managing for a range of, of values and um, maintaining wildlife habitat uh, and really a balanced, healthy ecosystem. Um, so you, like you said, you said um, it's been 170 years you guys have been logging this woodlot. Um, how are you able to maintain your ecological value and continue to generate, generate revenue? Yeah, I think, um, to be honest, the answer to that is, is really more the qualities of the people who have been involved. Um, I think through that 170 years, the people who have been here as the stewards of this land uh, were motivated by more than money, <laughs> that they were motivated by a, a deep concern and care for the forest and the community around them and um, and actually were willing to exhibit some restraint in how they manage the land and um, uh, taking a much more careful approach. Um, why do you think people are um, more, why aren't more people turning their um, private woodlots into sustainable forests like Windhorse? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do a lot of uh, forestry consulting for private woodlot owners, and um, it should be acknowledged that our Acadian forest is actually uh, pretty severely degraded uh, from a long history of, of management that didn't take a holistic view of, of caring for the forest uh, for the long term. So a lot of our private woodlots, although are beautiful places that uh, serve important values for us uh, personally, spiritually, maybe wildlife values, as far as timber, that value has been extracted from the land a long time ago. Um, and so we do have a choice to make it. And as forest managers and woodlot owners, are we going to continue to extract an ever decreasing sort of value from the property? Or are we going to invest back in the forest and restore its its full potential? Um, what is the benefit of maintaining a sustainable woodlot? What is the benefit? It's, <laughs> uh, the benefit is uh, immense and probably impossible to quantify. Um, certainly there's a benefit in generating a timber supply and, and beautiful wood products that, that generate income, provide employment. Uh, but increasingly the benefits, I think uh, most woodlot owners will tell you the benefits, um, what really matters to them is actually the, the care for a place that is beautiful and healthy, uh, contributes to them probably spiritually on some level, uh, pro provides habitat for wildlife. Those are the things that actually become much more valuable to woodlot owners uh, over time. And the income, I think, uh, has an decreasing importance as you get into it. Um, any time I get to spend in the forest is time well spent. It says on your website that your goal is to be able to turn all the Acadian forests into sustainable forests. Do you believe this is a realistic goal? If so, what do you see as the timeline for this to be completed and what steps will have to be taken? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well that's that's a, that's a big question. Um, the I think the answer really lies in how you define sustainable. Um, so are we talking about sustainable as being able to keep up with our ever increasing economic demands and just keep churning fiber out off the land? Um, that's not really the vision of sustainable forests that I, I hold. And for me, sustainability um, is much more about uh, can we uh, create a decent human relationship to our natural environment? A way that allows us to access the things that we need and uh, generates a supply, but um, also in a way that doesn't abuse the land, uh, doesn't degrade its value, and actually leaves enough room for the other things that live in the forest, like the animals and the other ecosystem services that forests provide. 
So, and I really do believe that that's about the human relationship to the environment. And so that's what I'm working to restore is the forests themselves, trees grow, seeds fall and land in the earth. Um, it rains. The forest ecosystem can rebuild itself. It's, it's our relationship to the forest that needs to be worked on. You kind of answered this in that question, but um, why do you believe the forest is so important? <laughs> why do I believe it's so important? Well, for me, why it's so important is because I fell in love with the forest as a little kid. Um, it's the environment that I most naturally connect with, and it's the environment that um, uh, really helps me understand the world. I see how, um, how things are exchanged, how things uh, live and die, um, how things grow. Um, and it's a place where I, I can find uh, peace and relaxation in my, in my life. And that's, that's why forests are important. And, I, and nothing is more beautiful to me than um, uh, beautiful wood product, beautiful floor, um, beautiful carving, cutting board, uh, whatever it is. I mean, I think wood products are, are amazing. And I'm not anti-wood product, but... Um, but my, the importance of forests to me uh, uh, extends way, way beyond the things that come out of it. What is the biggest problem in Nova Scotia forestry today? I think the biggest problem in forestry in Nova Scotia today is that um, we're trapped in an economic model that just cannot be sustained. We, we view our forests largely in the context of uh, commodity products that the only way that those products can compete in a global marketplace is uh, by driving price and cost lower and lower, which means that we're putting more and more pressure on the people who work in the forests and we're putting more and more pressure on the land. And, and I think as long as we view the forest in the context of a commodity market, we'll never be able to make it sustainable. Um, so we have to be able to look at forests from a more holistic um, sense of what value is. Um, and we need to be able to um, work in forests and generate products that are uh, that really respect the whole context of the value for our forest lands. Uh, my next question actually is, what is the solution to this problem? But you kind of already touched on that. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Well, I think there are some interesting solutions showing up. I certainly don't have all mm -hmm. the answers, but when you look at what's happening and what people are trying to do, um, I see a lot of good forestry being practiced by woodlot owners. I and mean, woodlot owners, um, it's their, often it's like a family property that's been in the family for generations. There's an embedded care for that, that history of stewardship. Um, and, and I see a lot of good forest management happening there. I do see a change on, on larger scale forest management. We're um, implementing things like ecosystem-based forestry using ecosystem classification and understanding natural disturbance regimes to, to model uh, what kinds of harvests would be appropriate. Um, and the most exciting thing for me is changing our relationship to forests through initiatives like community-based forestry. And um, Nova Scotia is about to embark on its first community-managed forest, and we've been very fortunate to be involved in, in launching that. And, um, and that's really going to be a situation where the local community says, these are the values for the land base that we live in, um, and these are the objectives we have, and this is how we're going to work together as a community to care for that place. And that's really just changing the whole conversation around what, what a forest means and what our crown lands are. Um, what do you believe the government needs to do to help um, solve these problems that we have? Mm -hmm. Well, I think... Um, the government really, uh, I think they, they just need to be there to support uh, the good forestry that, that is happening. Uh, I think they have to be brave um, and recognize that the status quo is probably not going to serve us for very much longer. And now is the time to invest in alternatives and be willing to let some of those alternatives fail um, because one of them will work. And if we have a government that's just entirely risk averse and... Um, and only uh, spends its money propping up status quo of what, what has been or what has always been, then we're just, it's just uh, speeding up the, uh, the path to um, destruction, I guess. <laughs> it's a pretty bold way to say it, but, but I think that um, 
our forestry future could be very bleak um, and we could get there very quickly if we're not careful. Uh, so it's about uh, taking risk and being able, being willing to invest in, in alternatives uh, like community-based forestry, um, like innovative new wood products, like um, not only investing in big industry but invest in small-scale value-added producers and, um, and, and give woodlot owners the support that they need to, to be good stewards of their land. So invest in silviculture and those sorts of things, I think. Um, there has to be a balance in, in the types of investments we're making. Um, in your opinion, how does Nova Scotia compare to other provinces in improving forestry practices? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we've uh, uh, not had the best track record uh, in Nova Scotia, but I'd say uh, recently some very encouraging things have happened. Um, so um, there is a changing conversation around forestry. I think. In some ways, it's a product of the fact that things have gotten so bad, um, mm -hmm. you know, with major, major closure, closures of uh, big mills that were employers for hundreds of people. And seeing that kind of instability has, has caused everybody locally here to say, okay, we need to be looking for the alternatives because um, this, is, this is too rough. <laughs> this, is, this is too hard to see uh, entire communities losing their jobs. Um, and, um, and so I have seen the government make some of those investments and that's very encouraging. And, and I think there are some examples we should also not just think of these terms, these things in terms of uh, Nova Scotia or PEI or New Brunswick or for that matter, Ontario or Quebec. We really need to be looking at a, a national and even international context to say, where are those best practices? Um, and be willing to bring them here. So what if it started in Ontario? It's, it's a good idea, so let's use it here. Um, community forestry, again, is a good example of that. It's successful in BC, and we're bringing it here. Um, so, yeah, I, I, um, I do see some opportunity for the government to be involved and, and to make good investments and be willing to, to also bring in those best practices from, from across the country. So our last question today is, if you could offer one piece of advice to those with decision-making power, what would you offer? Mm -hmm. um, one piece of advice, uh, go for a walk in the forest, <laughs> actually go out there, um, connect to it and um, figure out what, you, what inspires them about the forest and then make sure that um, the decisions they're making are actually in, in accord with, with that personal inspiration um, and, and be willing to take a risk because uh, we certainly thrown a lot of risk into uh, the status quo model. We've leveraged uh, the value of our land base uh, to the extent that it is badly depleted and we have leveraged the public money uh, to support big, big mills um, to a point where th those become major risks. If one of those goes down, it's a huge impact. So although the small a uh, value-added producer uh, might not have the deepest pockets and it might look risky. Is that really um, not also a risk worth taking? Thank you so much. Yeah.